Welcome to episode 100 minus one of the Carmudgeon <laughs> Show. My name is the person looking at Derek Tam and Scott, and that is the person looking at Jason Discount Sandler Camisa. How about that? And in this episode, we discuss, of course, vintage Mercedes Benzes, because what episode of the oh, Carmudgeon Show would be complete without discussion <laughs> of vintage Mercedes Benzes? But it is not the defining characteristic of this episode. The defining characteristic, if we could choose just one, is how cool can't. Mercedes wagons are. No, yeah. no, damn it. it is the dog leg transmission it is the well we'll get into the definition and the idiosyncrasies that are or intricacies of the definition of dog leg but yes this is the dog leg transmission episode um plus i got a lift so i get to work on my car yes we got a lift were there was there any other housekeeping that we had to attend to any acknowledgments of this or that nope uh, except that announcements you got the clap. Uh, but i got the clap was like a C plus. Oh, flies all over the room just <laughs> dropped in fear. No, they just flinched and yeah. then went on with the shit, shit eating that they were doing already. Mm. What the fuck did you just say? I said I was entering my plutocratic ears and that's why I need a W140. You are such a bizarre person. <laughs> I'm entering my plura plutocratic era yeah what so now you have to be a fucking dictator i mean i just want the car honestly okay. well good that, that's all you have we just had a whole conversation about this you can make all kinds of excuses about buying any old classic car or a new car or anything else and it's all subject to criticism and i dissect my friend's arguments when they, i need this because whatever blah 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 the ultimate like pff, get out of trump card don't we don't use the word trump anymore also, that apparently has been turned Shot off for three hours. Uh, the the ultimate non-Trump card is that you want it. Yes. And there. Which is, uh, I think, what I said when I said I was entering my plutocratic years. Yeah. Well, that that I can criticize and argue with. But you just, I want a one think I'm a good plutocrat? Derek, you work very hard. You're very smart with your money. <laughs> okay. Derek, you work very hard. You know, you study these things. You understand them. You know what you're getting into. You should have a 140. Yes, I can't wait for the pneumatic soft close door motor to really. That's fail. why you you want a 140. No, I, said I can't wait for it to fail. I know, but this is what you said to me earlier when we were on our way to lunch. Which, by the way, we had lunch, so we're going to be asleep in two minutes. You're like, I have to have a 140. I want soft closed doors. <laughs> is there a, is there a okay? So serious question: Is there a cheaper car you can buy that has soft closed doors? <laughs> Yeah, some shitbox E60. W140s are very, very inexpensive. E65, E60 BMWs. Those mm -hmm. with, I mean, an E65 745 pre-facelift I mm -hmm. uh, with the that horrible M62 that that blows you always see them smoking. Oil, oil smoke, yeah. They have to be worth $15, maybe $20. Yes, okay. Okay, price of a hamburger. Um, <laughs> I loved having soft closed doors. I lived across the street from an old Dutch guy years ago who had um, uh, all, I can't, very Alzheimer's. strong hearing Alzheimer's. Oh. <laughs> Funny that I couldn't remember the name for it. Uh, he had Alzheimer's. And he was very sweet, but he was very great old guy. Um, probably in his eighties, and he um, would be up all night. So part of the part, part of dementia is you don't really follow normal time schedules anymore you're up all night you're sleeping all day whatever and if i came home, <clears throat> i came home from the bars at like three two thirty three o'clock in the morning when i pulled up when i shut the door boom lights on out in the front door good morning how you doing and i'm like uh it's three in the morning like i'm i'm outy uh, no don't tell me if we wanted to chat <laughs> fucking soft closed doors saved my ass i had a couple press press cars and i just throw them to neutral boom, 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 hit the thing quietly just pull into the driveway without the engine running get out and soft close soft close and i would be able to sneak into the house before he woke up um huh. okay. you are not currently jet lagged i am largely completed yes but have just recently returned from europia where i yes. also haven't leave, I, I where i'm <laughs> well he's gone to sleep folks yeah. Uh, I was in Europe, yes, at and the same time as you, but in a different part of Europe. Yeah, it's true. We, we had one day overlap, I think. Uh, yes. Something like that. Yes, I remember you seeing you on Thursday. Find Mine, yes. and I'm like, oh, the closest friend to me is Derek, like in Portugal or something. I don't yes, know how you are. that's right. I was in Lisbon. 
Um, yeah, I would did a combination Switzerland and Lisbon trip, the old one-two. No, I'm just kidding. That's a pretty <laughs> unusual pairing. So um, no, I wanted to go to Switzerland to drive the 190E because it's had some additional maintenance uh, after its previous failures to do many things. As in uh, drive. And stop. So, and st- well, go. Well, it, it wouldn't stop stopping. That yes, was the problem. Okay, stop. so as a reminder, last year, September, I think, September, we wound up in Europe on a 2,000 kilometer Alpine rally, which mm-hmm. was fucking amazing for me because I was in Sretton's car from M5, M, M539 Restorations. It was an E30. It was a slow as shit, but it was otherwise almost perfectly reliable and wonderful at the same time as your recently acquired W201 190E was 2.316 Cosworth. I'm going to call that a 2.315 and a half. It wasn't yeah. quite up to. It wasn't full strength. So the the one thing that I don't understand is, so the brakes kept sticking on on that car, mm-hmm. which was maddening because when the vacuum booster was hooked up, the car stopped. I mean, the, you were foot to the floor in that tunnel. I'll never forget. Foot to the floor foot with to the, the accelerator. Gas pedal, yes. downshifting from gear to gear to gear to gear. And then I'm like, we're driving through this tunnel and I just hear, yeah. and I was like, what is going on? And then I realized that you guys were foot on the floor. In five, third. Five grand. I think you were, was third or second? Third. Either way, it was we were no longer going the recommended minimum speed limit of yes. 200 for Italy. Um, we were going 30 miles an hour. Uh, and so the brakes kept getting stuck on and my solution at the time was to unplug the vacuum booster because I thought the booster was bad and that was sucking the pedal down. Then it kept happening, not as, not as dramatically forcefully forcefully because there wasn't vacuum boost behind it, but they were getting stuck on. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand this because to use the Italian term, the push rod between the pedal and the master is not adjustable for length. Mm-hmm. as we discovered when yes. we tried to adjust it for the seventy-five thousandth time we were on the side of the road what was it they replaced the booster something inside of the booster was causing the issue it okay. was the only thing left in the entire braking system which was not replaced but how does it even the car happen? had new calipers brake lines rotors pads master cylinder all of that was replaced i don't know that's the weirdest thing anyway a new booster fixed it I mean, we sort of concluded that that was the issue because afterwards we were like, everything has been replaced except the booster. Yeah, but I thought it was a bad master. I thought the master was somehow improperly... No, we replaced the master before we... Oh, that's uh, right, we did. Before the rally. That's right. On the, the night before the, the rally, we went to the junkyard, and I'm using like the three German words Haupt uh, Bremscylinder. Yeah, yeah. uh, three, three, actually, yeah. actually one German word yeah. because they put, run them all together in German. Yeah. Uh, in, into a, in a junkyard in Switzerland to get it, and then the guy I got yeah. it to him at 3 p.m. and I said I need the car at five to go to dinner, and he installed it between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. Didn't did we swap the master on the side of the road? We had no. it out of the car. No. We made a huge puddle of brake fluid in Switzerland. In, I'm surprised were, you're not in prison. Me, you're the one that went. Went. There's this huge that car wash. <laughs> there was this huge car wash. Then the big sign on it was like in German: "Don't ever drive your fucking car near here with an oil leak." Oh, and by the way, under no circumstances ever wash your engine. So there we were with the Mercedes with the hood up in service. Had to position. wash the brake fluid that we spilled all over the engine compartment <laughs> out. Otherwise, it would corrode the chassis. I did the most amazing walk away. I saw those guys coming, and I was like. Oh. Well, I don't oh, speak- is that the sun? And I, just went <laughs> I, don't, over there. I don't speak German. Yeah, well, that's why I had to get the fuck out of there. I do, and I knew what they were going to say to you. Um, yeah. That's bizarre that the uh, an unplugged vacuum booster was still somehow getting... The, I don't get it. I don't understand how ma- boosters work. Yeah, anyway. they're like automatic transmissions. They're just... Well, automatic transmissions take power and and deliver disappointment. Yes. And, and brake boosters take foot power and turn it into brake power or horsepower I don't, whatever it is it doesn't work i don't i don't get it i have i have shitty feeling brake feel on my shirocco for like more than 10 years now and i've replaced every single component in the brake system including the lines and hoses or including the flexible hoses and i can't figure it out and the did only the thing master? left i did the master three times yeah and the well, only maybe thing maybe the fourth time never mind. no but i did i thought i was swapping them back and forth between it and the and the cabbie and the only thing that i haven't done is the booster and so the booster has to be responsible for it there's no there's nothing else yeah. okay i didn't replace the calipers but they were everything was fine i did break hoses uh on it to get rid of the original rubber brake hoses with and i did stainless steel lines and that's when it started did you put the rubber ones back in to see if that not yet it? but i have brand new rubber ones to put in now that i have a lift i haven't told you i have a lift you did tell me on the show 
No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So continuity. <clears throat> okay. Let's try continuity that again. Editor. Oh my god, Derek! I have something to tell you. What? I have a lift. No yes. shit. Congratulations. Thank you. And I have definitely shit, uh, <laughs> but I have not put shit on the lift yet. This is a lifetime achievement that I've been waiting for many years. I have so my garage at home. Which from which I've made many an Instagram post is actually just a small two car garage. It's 20 and a half feet by 20 and a half feet. It's actually pretty small with a 15 foot door. My cars are so small that it looks big, but it's not. It's you can't, I, the minivan and the e golf barely fit in there together. I mean, that's, and the golf is not big. Um, and the ceilings are eight feet 10. And so for the last, I've been in this house many, many years, 13, 14 years, I've thought about different ways of raising the roof because i wanted to put a lift in there did you try the song never mind oh, no i'm not even gonna we're not gonna go there we are gonna sing a tribute to miss tina turner oh yes miss tina turner has passed. we i don't a know swiss what day this uh this podcast swiss will singer. Arrive, but she passed away at lunch <laughs> while we were at lunch um, yes. and that is a huge loss for the world mm -hmm. um but I'm not going to sing because I have respect for her and her artistry and I don't want to shit all over it with my voice. Anyway, so I thought about many ways of vaulting the ceilings in there and getting a lift. And the, and the, the interim solution was a set of quick jacks, quick jacks which work fine, um, except for the minivan. The minivan fell off the quick jacks twice. But the reason that I got the quick jacks is because I had the cabriolet fall off jack stands while I was underneath it. Mm. And thank God, I think I've mentioned this on the show. That genuinely scared the shit out of me. But I had, I had jack stands. The car was on the jack stands. I had my forty dollar twenty five year old hydraulic aluminum racing jack underneath the motor on a. On a uh, subframe brace that I have on there. And then I had the wheels under the sills and the car flew off the jack stands. And it was one of these, so the car doesn't have jack points, pads or anything. It used the pinch weld. And I just was stupid and I wasn't paying attention. And so if the car is sort of longitudinal this way, I did the jack stands. Typically what I do is the wood goes alongside the, like for a 12, like a piece of two by four goes along the pinch rail. And then I put the jack stands on it longitudinally, no, laterally, across, transversely, basically across. So the wood can't move and nothing can really move. I just kind of wasn't paying attention and I put the claws of the jack stands front right to back. Right, so it's balancing. And it's balancing that weight. And I was under the car, wasn't touching anything, I was just kind of looking up, I don't remember what I was doing. And all of a sudden, boom, in one split second, one jack stand flew out across the garage and the other one just moved and fell over. And the jack there was weight already on the the jack that was supporting the engine that caught it now thank god i had the wheels under the sills that would have caught it also but possibly not after it cracked my skull open it was fucking horrifying mm. so that was when i called i use hockey pucks instead of wood on a Between pinch rail the, yeah those pinch rails on those that, the car are so weak that they'll bend right in so i i distribute the weight over a foot mm, um it also bends the there's no fucking they're so stupid Anyway, but like the hockey pucks work really well when you have a pad or a flat yeah. surface. Yeah. So anyway, so I got the quick jacks that they're much safer. I mean, you're under that car. You can really rail on it and move it around and they're not moving. Uh, they proved to be great. The bigger issue is that it's not actually the jack stands that's the problem. It's my fat ass is too old and I'm just too old to roll around on the floor and get up and get a tool and go back down and get I up. Do it's just, hate that. It just sucks. Yeah. Um, and 15 years ago, I started hanging out with my friend Bill Arnold, who I've mentioned a couple times, a couple thousand times. He's a saint and he's let me use his, his uh, voice. And once you work on your feet under a car, you can't go back. So rather than figure out a way to spend genuinely six figures of money to vault the, the ceiling because everything in Northern California is so expensive. It would cost me a fortune to have to recast the roof of the house. So right now it's trust. And so I would literally have to rip the roof off the house and put a new roof off. And it was stupid. Like if, if I spent a hundred thousand dollars, which is what you could buy a fucking new house for um, other places in the country uh, to maybe to a vault used the, house, a used house, uh, to vault the ceilings, I would not get $100,000 in extra value to the house. So it's literally pissing out of the wind. Okay, not literally, but it's figuratively, <laughs> it's wasting fucking money, which I can't afford to do. So instead I bought a warehouse. And so the, the point of the warehouse is that it has 13 foot ceilings and I could get a lift. That was a year ago and I've been so busy trying to make that mortgage payment every month that it 
didn't occur to me that the reason that I bought that place was not just car storage, but then to get a lift. So I talked to the lovely people at Bend Pack. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, we talked about the, what to do. And it's, I don't have a lot of space. It's like 1,200 square feet. And I have six cars in there. So they have a, 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 a hoist called the GP7. 7,000 um, pound lift. Uh, it's a two post, just a regular work work service lift. But it only has one hydraulic cylinder that goes across the top and then uses chains um to or i guess uh, for a more compact footprint right so you don't get the big uh verticals and it's in and i the first the day it was installed i got food poisoning and was down for two weeks uh that was no i i do not recommend hold on what was it called shagella i don't know if you've ever heard of it but it's low one, NPS, low, low recommendation score on score. that. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's up. I mean, it's one of the I think there are five major foodborne illnesses, like including E. coli that we've all heard of and Giardia. And another one is Shigella. Oh, holy shit. And I mean that literally. unholy. Yeah, unholy shit. Um, so anyway, so that all got done and I never used it and whatever. And I finally just got all my tools moved over there because that's a huge problem all the tools are at the house so all the tools are now there and i can start have you done a job yet i put the car in the lift and tested it and you know there's as always when you have a lift installed anything installed there's always teething problems so there's a bunch of bolts that weren't tight and there's a bunch of like there's the the lock release lever was improperly installed so i i sort of fixed all that got the car in the lift got the tools there and then went to europe for philodesta so uh, i will be doing Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my quick jacks there too. And I'm going to have two bays. So I have the quick jack bay. I'm going to do the timing belt on the Honda Beat. And I got some just some maintenance stuff I want to do on the Scirocco while it's there. Fucking massive tranny leak and a bunch of other stuff. But anyway, I never Congratulations. Thank you. Lifelong dream achieved. I mean, only takes, how old am I? Don't, do we, should we tell them? You know, 29. Plus almost 20. Yeah. I mean, I'm nearing 50 years old and I finally have, uh, you know, a lift. That I haven't used yet, but I will. But I, oh, and that was the other thing. Fuck Milwaukee tools. Because they're really, really good. And I had to buy a whole bunch of Milwaukee tools and I spent a lot of money. Oh, so unfuck them. So unfuck them, but fuck them. Like I'm really excited. I can't wait to use this shit. So I went, I, I sort of replicated. I have one set of tools at home that I'm just leaving there. And like I have a Ryobi gun that I hate because it could barely pull off a lug nut. But I have, like these battery ecosystems are dangerous because at home I have a Ryobi drill, a Ryobi impact, and then I have a Ryobi wet dry vac that uses the same battery and a weed whacker and an, um, what's it called? A leaf blower. So now Ryobi batteries stay at home and then uh, Milwaukee's are at the shop and the Milwaukee the fucking gun pulled a lug nut off and threw it across the room. It was like, Ping! like with the it's insane. Really? Where my Ryobi is like, Arr! even with a full charge. So, um, yeah, but okay. very expensive shit. Well, Milwaukee, if you're listening, a bunch of other shit I could use. Oh, do you need okay. more stuff? No, I don't need more. I don't really. I bought everything because I just want to. I can't. I wanted a fully functioning thing. Anyway, super excited. Bring your car over when you're back. And now let's go back and talk about your two, oh, 201. So you did, you flew to Switzerland. Zurich. Yeah. Zurich. Zurich. Yeah. And you picked up your ship. Uh, shitbox. X shitbox. Uh, the brakes work now. And that wonderful melodic um, belt noise, which we uh, so enjoyed in Cortina d'Ampezzo. <gasps> Hold on. I need everyone to hear this. This is an insert. Okay, the best part about that belt noise was when we were in a hotel. I think, I don't know if we told the story, we were in a hotel and I run into an I old, old, old friend of mine. Oh, yes. And his wife did. in for breakfast. And I got to tell it again. And they're like, oh my God, what are you doing here? The world is so small. They live in Austria. We're in Italy coming from the US and we just run into them for breakfast. This guy's staring at me and Derek's like, is that a fan? And I'm like, God, he looks just like this guy, Michael. I'm like, Jason, is that you? And so total surprise and they're asking what I'm doing and they're like, oh, you, what are you, we're here in old cars. Oh, you better not be that fucking Mercedes that's ruining the whole uh, mood <laughs> every morning. Yeah, that. they did. She said, Daniela said oh. that. She was like, every morning, just ah! this horrible belt squeal. It was the, think about the most beautiful places you've ever <sighs> been in the world. This peaceful, gorgeous, picturesque, unbelievable Italian landscapes ruined by the squealing sound of Derek's shit pile Mercedes. repeatedly. 
Okay. That's true. So the tensioner's replaced, the belt's replaced too. So Did that's they... silent and operational. Uh, everything's fine except for the air conditioner. Okay, that's still cocked. Yes. Okay. It's on uh, its own belt, right? If yes, I it correctly. is. Correct. My uh, 2.316 doesn't have I wish. Audio I mean, mine doesn't not, other. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the, it has a compressor. But, but it's not non-functioning. Functioning. Okay. Uh, so yeah, those two, two, which what I would say would be the most problematic, offensive okay. of the car's mechanical shortcomings mm-hmm. are solved. And I didn't open the hood once. Maybe I did once just to see if the engine was in there. Mm-hmm. But on the on this trip, I didn't. You know, there was no maintenance. There was no roadside stopping. There was no wow. using of tools. How many kilometers did you put on? Put on it? I, I don't know. F- 600, 500 kilometers, okay, maybe. 300 miles, 300 plus miles. To um, the Italian border and back. That's pretty. I mean, considering the car barely made it 50 feet the last time without mm-hmm. breaking down. I am not ignoring you with using my phone. Um, I would like to give a shout out because I I mentioned that. Oh, yes. Yeah, speaking of 190 E's. Yeah, I mentioned that my Mercedes, which is always perfect and never breaks and never gives me any shit. Um it's rear view mirror exploded. Was, Mine did that too. It's the weirdest fucking thing. It's, it's such a strange failure mechanism because like, like a mirror you touch, you know, how often do you adjust your rear view mirror? It's, it Rarely. wasn't even the, the anywhere near the adjustment mechanism. It's the weirdest thing is it's the day night on mine anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mine did exactly the same, same thing? thing. Mine's held in place with a binder clip right now. Yeah. So the day night mechanism has a spring in it. So it, you know, goes ka-dunk, ka-dunk to one side. Um, but it, that's where that spring obviously overwhelms the plastic on the back of the on the mirror and explodes out. Um, but anyway, I had mentioned um, that your mirror, had, mirror failed. had failed and somebody on Instagram sent me one. Um, and he is a part supplier that hold on. I have. To I will in. need to secure one from the same place because yes. the binder clip charming though it is. Uh, is yeah. ready to retire. You could use my old one because I taped mine with gaff tape, which is black and it doesn't look all that bad. Now I have no day night and it wiggles a little bit, but doesn't have a binder clip. Anyway, RPM Depot um, is the is the name. So it's RPM hyphen depot.de. Um, and he gave me a very fair price and shipping was a fortune, but he is <laughs> no, <laughs> that's Less not than his the fault. Mirror. Um, no, the shipping was more than the mirror. Um, more than the mirror but it's uh, whatever it was here in four days i have a mirror it's not in the car yet but it will be it's perfect i owe him one that was really cool because i've been looking for months on ebay and i finally found one there are multiple lengths uh, widths i guess of mirrors um and we have the early 201 mirror Mm -hmm. size yeah my car is is a very early one it doesn't even have the articulating wiper yeah you have the ghetto wiper yeah, with the mini wiper, the yeah, auxiliary mini wiper. A little, yeah, a little thing. Like um, a boxer. Yeah, so, anyway. uh, so yeah, that car is um, fine, uh, other than it still needs a little bit of fuel injection work, but it was always able to get it started, just a little recalcitrant So it's still warm. doing the same crank and crank and crank and fire. Yeah, only then... when, it's sat, when it's warm and it's sat for an hour. If you restart it immediately, it's fine, and if it's cold, you, it starts fine. It's you only know what we're going to do. For an hour. We'll mm. figure it out. We're going to get it here. We're going to put it on my lift, which we don't mm. need to do, but we can. And then we're going to measure fuel. fuel. It's just vapor lock. It's yeah. the, the fuel system's bleeding down. Um, CIS problems, hashtag. Pound yeah. sign. Um, and uh, what else? So is that going to come home? Eventually, yeah. Maybe okay. uh, by by September it will be on its way back because it's been it's registered for a year and we registered in September and so I don't want to register it again. So it could be back for Bruno Sacco's 90th birthday. November the 12th. Yeah. So yes. we did we say this on the show? Or I did, think we may think have we mentioned did. that we wanted oh, yeah. to do a... A, a little Sacco, Sacco car birthday show. party on the, and I, the 12th is a weekend. I forget yeah, whether it's Saturday, Saturday or Sunday. But I think we need uh, to get 90 cars to celebrate 90, 90 Bruno Sacco. So we, yeah, I have to start buying, a, I got to buy my W140 yeah. and I got to get my other Sacco cars. Oh, speaking of other Sacco cars, my wagon is... The purple um, dog yeah, The purple leg dogleg wagon. Sportline wagon is um, in Los Angeles, port of uh, Long Beach right now. GTFO. And it'll be by Friday, it's due, the boat is due here, and then they have to unload it and decontainer it mm-hmm. and unpack it. And I learned this verb, or I guess it's a noun, drayage, mm-hmm. which is transport from the port to the freight forwarders warehouse. Is that it is drayage or drayage? Oh, that could be, know. yeah. I don't know. So uh, it has plus, to be, all that has to happen. So Don't forget, you also have a 202. Oh, yes. I yeah, have a 243 well. AMG is a Bruno yeah, Sacco yeah. car. How many Sacco cars do you have? Uh, f- five. No, I sold the R129. You did? I sold the R129. Okay. So I'm down to four Sacco cars, but if I buy a 140, it'll be back to five. Mm-hmm. But I am going to sell the E320 sedan 
in short order here. When when the E320 wagon. I mean, it's uh, actually going into the body shop to get it some dents pulled, and then it'll be ready for sale. Cool. Right. So the sedan will go away, and then we'll have the wagon and the 190 and the C43 and maybe a, f- a 140. If I can find a 95 or newer 500 or 600 sedan, that would be that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so uh, then but, not a manual. Uh, correct, because you could get the dogleg transmission in the S class. Uh, with the 300 SE. <sighs> Not I mean, here. to talk about a unicorn, a stick shift S class with a dog leg. Yeah, it's totally outrageous. Yeah. I think it is the most improbable dog dog leg car ever. Um, I'm just Ooh. trying to think. Oh, wait, hold can, on a second. Can you think of any other more improbable? I oh, mean, before we leave the topic of Europe, I was in on the island of Madeira, which is... Uh, As one does. Atlantic, Where? In uh, the Atlantic, oh. uh, off the coast of Morocco. And When the fuck were you there? Uh, on the same trip. Popped the over on trip. the way over. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, on the same trip. Uh, Switzerland and Portugal. It's part of Portugal. Okay. And they are still using... Uh, there was one 123 taxi, and there was a number of... Quite a number of 124 taxis. Mm-hmm. And uh, some 210 taxis and, and two 202s. So lots of vintage Mercedes Benzes being used as taxis. And of course, I had to hail one. Uh, and, <laughs> of, but of course. And it was uh, the guy bought, had owned it for 32 years. And it had 1,150,000 kilometers. Oh, cool. He bought it. He was a second owner. He bought it in Belgium. It was a 250D, naturally aspirated with a manual transmission. Originally silver, you could see in the door jams, but it was yellow because it was a taxi with a blue cloth interior. Uh, Oof, and it's a color combo. Yeah, yeah. Very um, University of California. Yeah. Actually, it's a color combination of the Mira, yellow with a blue interior. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so it was very fun to ride around in that yeah. as a taxi. And he was like so gentle with the car, like very slow about engaging gears, not yeah. very judicious about full throttle use. Just mm-hmm. you were like, oh, this is why it hasn't survived a million over a million kilometers so that was very enjoyable also uh great entertainment for like 20 euros of taxi riding <laughs> did you I take was a like, taxi ride 20, and go, no i said just nowhere. drive around i said just drive around oh my God. 20, give me give me 20 euros worth of driving <laughs> and i would like to stop and take some photos so i did that's that. awesome okay <laughs> um, that's cool. so now i kind of want a manual diesel uh but i, I don't need any more sacco cars besides the 140 uh okay. so yes uh, 140 dog leg 300 SE in Europe. Uh, you could get that configuration, mm. but I mean, normally we associate dog leg with performance. That's kind of where it originated. And I think Schwarz we should Getriebe. probably talk about why. Yeah, because absolutely. there are a lot of people. So don't... dog leg. De- let's start with definition first. Dog uh, leg is so a dog has four of them, <laughs> but a transmission has an odd number of legs when it's a dog leg. It could have two. Uh, you and actually fact, the, and, and and the Citroen du Chevaux is a four-speed dog leg because the French, <laughs> because um, France. Yes, I don't know. I genuinely have no idea why they did that. Uh, but yeah, dog leg means that first gear, rather than being up and to the left, is down and to the left. Not necessarily. You could have a dog leg up. So basically, if let's, I mean, let's name a I'm car sorry. that does that. There are cars with dog leg reverses that are different. So a dog leg is a gear that that has on a one on a up down plane or four aft plane only has one gear. So typically you have an H pattern where first would be top left, right? And then second is below it. Well, if you don't have anything below that, that's a dog leg. So for example, so you think BMW, a standard BMW or Porsche is a BMW dog leg? BMW 5-speed is a double dog leg because you have a dog leg for reverse. And then you, uh, no, you don't. I'm sorry. There's only one dog leg on those. There's kind of none if you consider first and reverse aligned in the same plane, which they are not. Reverse is actually to the it's left, of slightly yeah, yeah. to the f- of first. I don't know how you're defining dog leg. The it's, way it's I define outside it, of the, outside of the H pattern. So I define yes. it as a gear that's outside of the H pattern. So a five speed, technically the f- fifth is a dog leg. Okay. Right. If you think about it that way, it's a dog leg out to the right. Um, that's not the um, functional operating definition of dog leg because then you would say any five speed gearbox that right. has reverse so next d- to first. So is while a dog we're leg. on the in the semantic department, yes, when we talk about when we talk like a dog leg transmission is colloquially a colloquial speak ism, ism for a transmission where the first, where first is gear is outside the H, and typically that means I think bottom left. Always bottom left, yeah. Um, 
And people often ask why, because the the, the big drawback is zero to 60 times. Um, most cars will hit 60 in second, or at least require a one, two shift to mm -hmm. get to 60 miles an hour. And a one, two in the same plane is a very quick shift straight down. Yes. A one, two, when you're going from one plane, when you up over to the right and then up Forward, again, yeah. is a very slow shift. Um, and if you guys have ever... And if you try to speed shift, it, it doesn't go well. It just doesn't. It's just not easy. And it, if certain ones like Porsches, the 901, the 911s that are dog legs, like, for, especially for someone who's never driven one, I would say that 50% or more of the time that you are trying to go for second, you get you get uh, fourth. Fourth. Yeah, thank God, not reverse. Not reverse. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you ever watch... Um, so when we test cars, when we do 0 to 60 times on manual were brutal. I mean, there was a guy at Motor Trend uh, who, every time he was testing a car, I I just cringe because it genuinely sounded his one two shift sounded like a DCT, and it was so fast that he would bend shift forks and do whatever. But hey, this is the idea we're is, trying to get. But the manufacturers the like I will gladly trade a shift fork for a faster zero to sixty time right. that I can put in my marketing. Yeah, materials. and you can lop off two, three, four tenths of a second by shifting really quickly. So people hate dog legs for that. But, however, the benefit is, and this is the origin right. in motorsport, is that basically you use first gear to get going and then you never use it again. And so if you're always hanging out in second through fifth gears, then you don't have to do so much cross-plane travel and first gear is just kind of hanging out over there when you need it to get going and then never again. And never again. In ra racing. Under racing conditions, yeah. yeah. So when, when cars went from a four-speed to five-speed, the, the most logical thing to do was get the one gear that you never use until you're moving. Of course, the um, exact opposite is true if you're doing stop and go in traffic right, exactly. and driving that's, around in town and stuff like that. And that's why you'll see it, especially in period, referred to as a racing layout, right? Yes. Because it's a pain in the ass for the, for the road, but... Now, you know, these cars aren't commuter cars typically with dog leg. Yes. Um, it, Unless it, you're having an S-Class, which is, makes it all the more absurd that, a, you know, 4,500 pound, I mean, maybe not with a six cylinder uh, S-Class would have that shift pattern used. And, and by the way, while we're talking about that, I mean, that's, that is an M104. So that's a 7,000 RPM, 24 valve, twin cam, variable valve timing, straight six. That and has no business being in an, an S-Class at all. But yeah. that is the exact reason why that transmission so cool. is used in that car. Because every time Mercedes made a manual behind that engine, which is a very sort of spicy piece of equipment in terms of technical spec, uh, they wanted the sport gearbox to be mm -hmm. attached to it, so they call it the Sportgetriebe, I think, if yeah. I've said that correctly. Sportgetriebe, yeah. uh, Which is really cool. So yes, S-Class, you could get it in the SL, you could get it in the E-Class, the uh, W124, yeah. and, and the uh, that gearbox was yeah available in the Cosworth as well. Um, and BMW did a, a, a similar thing, right? So Euro yes. E30 M3 got a dog leg. US, they put a five-speed in it because they realized that Regular Americans five are dumb. Yeah, sorry, regular. Um, yeah, and you could get an E28 and the E24. So, so M5. these are uh, five series and six series. You can even get it with a M30 with, in a 535. Really? Uh, and oh, the 635 order. and uh, the first three series, the the you know E21. 2002 Turbo and 2002 really? TII also had a dog like oh, five speed option. This I did not know. Mm -hmm. And the M1. The M1 was but awesome. It's, I think a different gearbox because it's, yeah. well, it's, it's mid engined. I don't know. I would I would suspect so because it's transaxle. But yeah, the M1 was also dog leg. And th what we find is when you look through history, most of the cars that have dog legs are special cars. Yes, it's just uh, like the transaxle. I think it's a, mm -hmm. there's a lot of parallels because it's something that you do that originated in motorsport. Uh, and for very special road cars, it is used. Although every so often there are these kind of weird exceptions, you know, like the Maserati Quattroporte being a transaxle uh, mm -hmm. or the W140 S Class being a dog leg. There's the every so often there's yeah. some. But there's always a cool reason behind it, right? The yes. Maserati Quattroporte was a, was a transaxle because they wanted perfect weight to Ferrari, yes. which was engineering the car together with, Lamb with uh, uh, Maserati. Maserati, wanted perfect rear biased. Mm -hmm. Weight, weight distribution, which is Which amazing. is not something you get in an executive car. And, you know, yeah. as we just talked about, that's why it was behind the spicy engine when they put it in the S-Class. Yeah. Uh, but yes, other cars to have used this, there's probably some early, f uh, like, Fiat um, Abarth-type mm -hmm. things that I don't know about that use that pattern. Uh, what else? Well, well, we're, we're talking early, every three-speed. Yes. By, okay. When you definition. talk about like a three on the tree, or even a yeah three on the f floor, like those ones, they'd always have reverse in the top left and first below mm -hmm. it. That's just the way things were. This is like forties Chevy pickup trucks right. and every other American Pierce car. Pierce Arrow had a it was a yes, three speed. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, there's another three speed. 
uh, that was quite later. That was also dog leg. But I mean, this was no used choice. into the fifties. Right. Yeah. Like you could still buy uh, like Corvettes, Corvette Stingrays as three speeds. That's so crazy. Uh, and they would have this yeah. shift pattern. This would be C two yeah. Corvette. So That's into so the wild. mid late sixties. I mean, the thing is, late into the late eighties, there were plenty of cars on the road with three speed automatics. Three speed automatics, um, but, yeah, but not but, manuals. Well, I think, I mean, by that point, you know, it's 20 years after the manuals had given up, you know, like on three yes. speeds, they were on to four and five. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, automatics were lagging behind, and now every automatic is eight, nine, or 10. I guess. Well, seven. now that the Dodge Journey is out of production, we've lost the world's last four, four speed, speed automatic. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think, I don't know of anything that's a five speed anymore. I'm sure there's something out there. Yeah, it's probably some like. A uh, Mercedes think. Sprinter probably got rid of that relatively recently. Yeah, so Mercedes uh, is on nine, nine for their front front drive cars, and seven into nine to for their rear drive cars. Uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. But manuals are hey, the last production manual transmission dogleg car that I can think of is the Aston Martin twenty seventeen Aston Martin V eight V twelve Vantage S seven speed. Yes, uh, that and the only seven speed dogleg. Yes. That we know of, the one, yeah, the only one that I can because there's of. only three seven-speed manuals that I can think of: the Corvettes, Porsche. Porsche, Porsches, yeah. and, the, and then Aston. The Aston. And then Aston, interestingly, was a Graziano transmission that was the automated manual was the identical transmission. They just mm. removed the hydraulics and put. That's cool. Um, That's very cool. Yeah. But I love that 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 car did sixty six or sixty four miles an hour in second gear. Yeah, when which we is tested it. Very short gearing yeah. for a for, for two hundred mile an hour. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And the best part, it, it was like a. 500 horsepower Miata and, yeah. and it's it gears gearing was almost identical to a Miata in fact um and then if, they just add one more gear on on the seventh uh yeah yeah but it uh it was, it was which is just what gets you fast. from Miata top speed of 130 or 140 miles an hour to, to 190 miles right, an hour from of the, the Aston it was uh it was a great car to drive in the in the on the street but the crazy thing was when we tested it it was actually faster starting out in second <laughs> um, because you're getting rid of that long one, two shift. Huh. Um, and it, you know, a 500 and whatever that 560 horsepower, whatever that monster was, um, it has the torque, has the torque to, to dump the clutch and spin the wheels in second gear and a 66 mile an hour second gear. No problem. Yeah, so you, it's an auto. It's, a, it's like a doing a one speed automatic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's fast as way. Um, uh, and, but that car was the last dog leg, but it was also the first dog leg in a long time yeah. because the last dog leg before that Diablo Diablo. Yeah. Diablo 6.0, 2001. Because that went to a six-speed... When in, the Murcielago came when out. When the Murcielago came out, yeah. In 02. And do you, there are no dogleg six-speeds. I mean, that would... Let's no. be honest about that. It would be asinine. No, you would only do it with a seven with an odd number with of gears. With an odd number of gears, yeah. Uh, with the exception of the Ducheveau, which is a dogleg four-speed. But that's French. No, no, okay. Yes. So the fourth is hanging out in the top yeah. right corner the way fifth we normally associate with. Uh, and As a dogleg. As a dogleg. Uh, of its, double dog. Yeah, double dogleg. Yeah. That one... Maybe, except for reverse, if you put it with first. Uh, and then Ferrari used this pattern a lot in every transaxle five-speed car ever that I can think of. They did some non-transaxle five-speeds uh, five for the two plus twos. Mm -hmm. uh, but every other five-speed, you know, transaxle Ferrari will have a dog leg. So 246 yeah. and 330 GTC all the way through Testarossa mm -hmm. 512M. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and all of the five speed, yeah, all the five, yeah, that's true. All, yeah, you're right, never mind, totally. Once they went to six speed, the F355, that was for six speed mm -hmm. for the mid engine cars, for the um, mid engine cars, mm -hmm. and then the 456 got one in '92. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what, I find it a little disappointing that so Kuntash has a dog leg, yes, but Mira was not, yes, I know. I, I agree. That's out of character with the exoticness yes, of, that of the rest car. of the car, yeah. Uh, but Lamborghini, yes, so they the Countach and uh, Diablo were dog legs, but also their eight cylinder cars were all dog legs. So, Yurako's mm -hmm. Silhouette and Yalpa. Espada was a. Uh, Espada is not. not. That would make sense. That was the family Lamborghini, right? I don't yes. I've not driven one. I don't know if it. Um, I'm not sure I have either. I've driven a Yurama and a the 400 GT and. I need to go look at this. And, and as Lero. The the uh, Espada is a dream car of mine. Is it? Oh, that yeah. would make sense. It's Gandini. It's it's B12. just wacko. You know, mm -hmm. I love the the dual rear windows. One of which is horizontal, and the other which is vertical. That's bizarre, but okay. Espada was not a dog leg. You're right. Yeah, um, that would make sense because every mm -hmm. other front engined um, 
Lamborghini is not a dog leg. Not true. LMO2. That's true. I love. Yes. That's one of my That's favorite things one. about the Lamu 2 is that you yes. have this the Rambo Lambo, this ridiculous looking butch truck with a dog leg, yeah. five speed, and a Countach motor. Yes. Especially with the carburetors. Yeah. God, that makes like anyway, 77, 16, I think. It was this huge amount of weight. Wow, 67, 16, whatever. Some fucking enormous amount of weight. And the, they're, they're slow. They're not fast. And so yes. you're screaming to six or seven, eight thousand RPM every just gear in a anywhere. dog leg. Yeah, just to keep up the traffic. Yeah. It's just so cool. That's very rewarding. Mm-hmm. Uh, other dog leg applications. Uh, so that I believe, this is my instinct, that the M1's dog leg ZF was probably used by a number of other manufacturers such as Maserati in the Bora mm-hmm. and uh, probably also Pantera. Which, yeah. Uh, because they're all mid-engined with the transmission in front of the, or sorry, behind um, behind the, as a the engine as opposed to the uh, Countach layout where the transmission is in front of the engine even though it's is, longitudinally mounted which is completely wacko yeah uh, although the Veyron also does that and uh, let's see who Alpha. else Alfa Romeo um, Montreal. Montreal yes the Montreal also does that and but apparently it the is six front engine the six surprises me I've never yeah. even touched a six before Wiki i think i've that. seen I one no, no, no. um but i guess it's not a transaxle like the alfetta and gtv6 mm-hmm. but it does is it is a use of the buso so yeah. I, they probably put you know maybe they could have uh, so who else did a v6 with a dog leg at the same or before that slightly would be the fiat dino mm-hmm. uh and you could also get a dog leg in a number of other front engined uh, v layout cars the aston martin v8 the 70s mm-hmm. one uh, and 80s uh, and 90s in the form of the Virage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, who, someone else was doing that around the same time. I'm trying to think of who it was. Slightly later was Maserati Biturbo was also dog leg. Oh, I didn't consciously know that. I've never had the misfortune of driving a Biturbo. I have not either. But they're so pretty. And they sound pretty good too, but I just hear all these horror stories. Of course, about those things. What could possibly I, go I, right? Oh, I didn't I don't even know where the fuck my phone is. Ah, uh, uh, I did I, my I took, cheating. I took my notes on that, but uh, yeah, I think that's. Uh, let's see who else. Ford GT40 was dog leg. Yep, that makes well, that sense. that makes sense. I mean, Lamar car, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of it until hold the wiki page. Lancia of, Fulvia. Oh, that's right. You would know that. Yeah, the, the five-speed Fulvias, obviously, right. not the four-speed ones. Well, it's a different one uh, Stratos, because it's a Fiat Dino, a Fiat or Fiat, Fiat uh, t- uh, f- uh, Ferrari Dino, exactly. sorry, yeah. uh, transmission, so that's another one. But, I mean, Porsche did... Porsche did Porsche it on the did, 911 until 71. 912, right? 71 was the last year of the dog And then also and the 9, all 928s were dog legs, right? That are manuals, yes. And 924s were dog legs early, I believe. Re- I thought they were four-speeds. 924s are four speeds. And the five speeds were conventional layout? Uh, yes. Mm. I don't remember. Paolo's giving me a dirty look. I don't know. Maybe I should know this. Um, um, I had 924 in my notes, but I'd, I'd have to look. Maybe the five speed ones like a GT or something like that. So what would you consider 959? Is that a dog leg or not? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a regular six speed and they just got the labels wrong. Okay, so that's a... I mean, if you look at the shift pattern and the placement of the gears, mm-hmm. then the numbers it is, is a dog leg because then they have a gear that is... The, 928. Yeah, we talked yeah, about, we talk about 928, but look up 924 if you could, please. Um, uh, maybe GT. Try the 924 GT. If there was ever going to be a five-speed transmission, 924 it would be the GT, which is the car Were that they, they went to. all four speeds? I don't know no. about all of them. No, because the 924S, I dr- the only one I've ever driven was a 944 motored car. Yes, right? yes, which I S. don't really consider a 924. But of course, the badge doesn't. The whole car being a 924, I don't consider it. How could you not consider it a 924? It's You're a 924 right. okay. with the powertrain of a 944. Right? Which is what a 944 is. No, that got bulgy fenders and <laughs> yes, that got yes, other yes, shit. Yes, I know. And a, a nicer dashboard um, starting in 85 and a half. There was a bunch, when I looked this up, there were a bunch of American cars that had dog legs. And that was this really surprising. This was entirely surprising to me because I was trying to think of a non three speed uh, dog leg American car, but apparently such things exist. Um, uh, Pantera was, by the way, dog leg also. Yes, I did um, say that. Okay, so Datsun 210 wagon. Yes, yeah, so apparently I, I, I've seen some 510s kicking around with dog legs mm-hmm. in them. 
um, Ford Model A by, by the Subaru 360 Datsun 140Y. Um, but but the 76 to 77, according to Wikipedia, again, so I'm... But Which I'm guessing means right. according to some random person in front but, of a computer. But I'm sure... L- listen, if we get this wrong, don't bother fact-checking this shit. Because if we get it wrong, they're going to point it out to us in the comments. Um, 76 to 77, Oldsmobile Cutlass or Pontiac Le Mans with the 260 V8. The 76 to 77 That Chevy. probably just means it's a three-speed. <laughs> oh, that's probably true, isn't it? The 76 to 77 Chevy Vega or P- Pontiac Aster. 76 to 79 Chevy Monza or Buick Skyhawk or Oldsmobile Starfire. Those probably had to, let me look up Buick Skyhawk. Because that, See, that there, sort of sounds like a three-speed, doesn't speed, it? Yeah, it could potentially. 76 to 79. In which case, any three-speed, three you know, American car from choose decade between the 1920s and there the was 19- No, there was a four-speed Saginaw 60s. or Muncie manual or a five-speed T50 manual. Hmm. T50 is a gearbox from Borg Warner. Yeah, that is often used for five-speed conversions for E-types. But it's a dog uh, leg, T50? No, no, no. Okay, the, well, this well, is a- Not in the Jaguars that I've driven. I, uh, yeah, that's my, what... My mother owned an E-type with a, a T50. Uh, it could be that Wikipedia is not... Or Correct. that they change the shift pattern or any number of possibilities, yeah. which we genuinely don't really care about because yeah. uh, I've never driven a Skyhawk. But now I'm sort uh, of interested. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I think, I, I mean, put it this way. Is there a car on planet Earth that wouldn't be made more interested by a, interesting by a dogleg? Like if it I, had a well, if it was a six speed and you made it to five yeah, speed. Well. <laughs> You can do that. I mean, you have to do that on Mitsubishi Evos, for example. You have to make the six speeds are, are they explode. The five speeds are durable. Mm-hmm. And then if it had a dog leg, it would be extra cool, except you got to shift quickly on a turbo car because you really don't want the turbos to have that much, much time, time to, time spool, to down. spool down. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just love the idea of incongruent power yes. trains, right? The, ma- the mismatch is the, the best part. I mean, in a Ferrari, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. It's also, you know, is it, people sometimes ask, is it hard to learn or hard to drive? It's a little counterintuitive if you're super, super used to only one configuration. For me, I don't really notice anymore. Um, but it, yeah, maybe you initially a lot of different cars. disorienting yeah. if you've not done it. Because we have these sort of muscles. I think most drivers of manual transmissions have... M- memory muscle memory about like the feeling of a four three shift is just instinctively mm-hmm. this movement uh mm-hmm. and i think maybe if you have a lot of that stuff really hardwired into your brain then it could be a little disorienting uh i think in the seven speed it is a little confusing you're like doing gear changes and you're like, on which I don't one. Frickin- like in the aston i remember being like i know i need to do a gear change right now i have no idea gear- what gear i'm in but i see that the gear lever is in the back position so i'm mm-hmm. going to push it to the front position and you know that i'm only change. gaining one right yes so yes. of the three seven speeds the aston is the most difficult to use because mm-hmm. it is um the the resting position is three four gate i guess it's four five gate the way it should be um the issue and then you get a big detent you get a uh, you pushing to the left to get to the two three gate and you have a big detent to get first um it works but you got to get used to it the porsche one locks out the seven six seven gate is it core yeah it locks out the six seven gate unless you're in the five six gate so when you're going from f- that's clever from, see that's the way right, you do. from third to fourth four five yeah uh, four, five, you six, just seven, push yeah. it over the you way just you go would, over the way you normally uh, as would. far as you can because it's not going to let you right. into that and the six seven gate doesn't exist yet until you're in fifth and once mm-hmm. you're in fifth then you can go you know seventh so oh, i'm so confused fifth is down yeah six seven once you're in fifth you can go in six or seven so it, it works the problem is when you're doing a downshift so you come out of let's say you're in sixth so you pull it down towards you let it self-center and now where are you like now you got to think about this. So you can go down into fifth or going back right. <laughs> right. You just got to be careful. Mm. So when I first got the first dog leg car that I owned was, it was a Cosworth 190. And I never once contrary to the whole top gear thing. Like that was, that was fabricated. Oh, yes, they did stuff. this fabricated stunt where they had everyone going into reverse. Yeah, it was they, James May. Every time yes, he started yes. going, you can't on that Mercedes to get, to get over yes, to reverse to lift up on the, uh, the on the lever, get the lock physically, out. vertically, z-axis, straight up, right? Yes. Um, so you're the never going to accidentally did, do it. Or I guess in a Volkswagen, you'd push down. Yeah, which the Mercedes is less likely to happen. You're never going to be randomly pulling up on it. Which is a very Mercedes solution, right? They say, yeah. how do we ensure that nobody ever accidentally selects reverse? 
make it a motion that you would never do with a gear chain gear lever unless you were specifically because right. you know the ferrari is also to get the reverse lockout you have to push down yeah so it's just like a volkswagen but, you know the volkswagen stuff it's really easy to push down and go for re reverse for example when you're going for first i, I did that when I was younger in the Scirocco occasionally, you know, kind of go, you make a quick three point U-turn or something. Right. You, you are pushing, you are applying downward pressure when you're mistake. in addition to yeah. lateral. Exactly. Yes. And you just don't realize you're, you know, you're sort of under duress and moving around. Um, you'll never accidentally do that in the Mercedes, but I didn't have a problem doing that. Once, once you get used to it, you're fine. The thing that I found is the downshifts are the problem. So I'm in fifth and I need to go for third. You know, we normally instinctively go from, you know, five to three or, or something to make a real pass. What I did was when I first started driving that car, I would call out, out loud or speak to myself in my head out loud, which is not out loud at all, um, <laughs> the gear that I'm in and I'm going to. So I'd be like five going into three, five, three, and just be conscious of it now i don't even think about it yeah but the big mistake that everyone does is they go for second gear so i never downshift into a corner anyway i rev match every downshift i've never i don't ever drag uh drag clutch for a downshift but i've watched a bunch of people loop dog leg cars because they go down into first the way they would go to into second going into like a 90 degree right hand turn or something so you're kind of like going into your neighborhood oh. you go right down into what you think is second and start to pull the clutch out as you're turning in you're going to first, you have a lot more drag on the rear wheels than you think, lock them up and spin, right? No yeah. curb. Um, but that's terrible form anyway. You don't ever engage a clutch in a corner. Yeah, yeah. Ever. The shift has to be completed before you before you turn in or you've just failed the, you know, yeah, mismanners you, etiquette uh, on. Yeah, yeah. Shifting. And you just abort that gear change yeah, and, and figure wait. it all out later. Yeah. Um, but I did, you know, I've had a couple, a couple times where I'm like, oh, you know, again, one of the other things that's very important in a Mercedes, but... I do in all cars is you only have three fingers on the shift knob at all times. So, you know, I see people often drive with a fist and when you have a fist, you have no force feedback to your brain about how much effort you're really doing. That feedback isn't coming from your hand. It's coming from your shoulder, which is two linkages away. Um, most cars won't go into a gear that they don't want to go in. So if you're, you know, you're going to money shift a car meaning get into the wrong gear and vastly over rev it, um, there's going to be a lot more resistance to, to physically putting that car in that gear. Um, and if you have three fingers on the shifter, it's not going to work. Like I can't get, you know, you, you physically would not be able to get the Mercedes into first gear at 30 miles an hour coming in, slowing down for a right-hand bend. If you have three fingers on it, we're like, what's wrong? And that's your indication. Like, wait a second, I just broke two fingers. It's not going in and I'm just going to keep pushing harder. No, you just abort. Um, so that's, I mean, a gearbox finesse generally is something that I take very seriously. Uh, it's an old car habit for sure. Mm. Cause modern cars, every time I drive a modern manual, it's like, it just basically selects the gear for mm. you. The force is so light mm. and you know, I habitually am always trying to get that, t the feedback of feeling the synchros doing their thing and sort of pushing only with a certain specified amount of force. And if it doesn't do that, and this is a, a habit that you will rapidly pick up if you drive um dog like five speed ferraris <laughs> second gear is no. often just not denied. available yeah how do you say deny called? in italian denied in italian <laughs> yeah exactly no <laughs> yeah you they will not go it into second i mean until if, you warmed up. if you push it hard enough it will do it but it's a level of force where you're like i feel like i might be bending shit in here you would you'd break yeah. the linkage yeah so uh always mm. skip second and one of those, you know what I found out that cold. I did find a trick on mm. this, which I didn't realize. So I pull my, I, I leave my house down a hill. If you drive a couple hundred yards in second gear, that gear will warm, warm up enough that you can go right back into it. No problem. Yeah. So starting so, in second, right. So what I do is I would always downhill. start in the first and then go into third, right. Or in the third or fourth, right down the hill. And I realized if I just start in second, which is gone down a hill, it's no big deal. By the time I get sort of to the bottom of my neighborhood, I can yeah, but get if you had to second. go, if you lived at the bottom of a hill and had to start in second, that yeah, would be less it friendly. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't work. But yeah, interestingly enough, um, once the gear is engaged, it tends to warm up much more quickly. Because otherwise, I got a mile before I can get it in second mm -hmm. at all. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna too, too, too arm, too it. arm it. But you need to to get in second. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's that. The three finger thing is just a really nice. For a car that has, you know, synchro mesh that... Even in old cars. I mean, like a no, three to... I mean, uh, a new a, cars. A new cars. Does Isn't it? Really? Yeah. Yeah, because you don't ever need a lot of force. If you have... I mean, yes, you, and that's my impression generally. Most of them cars. 
a, a three to four shift, for example, which is usually the easiest, right? Because yes. a one to two, you're fighting against revs and synchros. But a three to four, if you're not using your third and fourth fingers and just pu- pulling straight back, something's wrong. Yeah. And you can make that fast. Okay, you use three fingers, second, third, and fourth finger, and really pull back fast. But if you're gripping it and yanking it back with your shoulder, yeah, no, you're no. begging to break I, stuff. When I see people do that, I'm just like, ooh. Get out. Get out. Yeah. It just, it, I feel so bad for the car. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is on my old cars, you can hear the synchros. <laughs> you can hear them. So it's like, yeah. oh my God, do you not hear that? That's your fucking transmission exploding. Yes, that's literally like metal yeah. shavings yeah. being generated. Yeah, literally. The transmission. I mean, it's metal on metal. It's, yes. Is there copper? Yeah, copper, yeah. bronze. Copper, bronze, bronze. Um, yeah, I have a rule though. If I fuck up an engagement of a gear, if I can feel the shift, I go back and do it again. That's just my sort of slap on the hand. Go back and do it again. Do it again. Do it again. It shouldn't be perceptible to the passenger. The passenger yes. should not know. You're going to have an interruption in power and then a, a, a continuation of power. But the passengers in my car should not when know the clutch. when the clutch is engaged and when the clutch is disengaged. They should only feel the lift off in power and the... and. You're pretty smooth. You're the same exact way. I mean, you could. Yeah, I try to do that. I mean, that. I mean that the depending work. on yes, it doesn't always work, and it depends on the car also. You know, a car that has pretty low gearing and a lot of torque, you can pull away from a stop and keep. Like my goal is to keep the tack exactly idle speed the entire time oh, from when really? the clutch is on the floor until when the clutch is all the way out. Ooh, and whenever I'm teaching, mean. whenever I teach someone to drive a manual, because mm-hmm. I notice a lot of people are quite poor at this. A lot of people are just like, Mrah! and then they just let the clutch out three thousand and dump. Yeah, it. and I, I just. I, yeah. that makes me cringe but my you know a lot of cars will not do what i just described but if it's a car with like reasonable amount of torque and that's not overly tall gearing then mm-hmm. it is possible to to basically get it so that the, and i say this is the standard you're aiming for when mm-hmm. i teach someone to drive a manual interesting is that the tack needle should never move until the clutch is all the way out huh um i i drive very differently i'm a blippy i'm a blipper yeah. Bum, 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 yeah, I mean bum, that's an old that's an old grumpy car thing. That's and a you carburetor require, trick, like, right? Hap- yeah, you require a good fuel injection in order to do what I just described. It wouldn't probably work in, in it like a yeah. you know like old American cars are carbureted in such a sort of unaggressive way that you could probably do it in one of those. But mm-hmm. if you're trying to do that on a car with a bunch of Webers and stuff, it's not going to do that. Um, well, it won't bl- it won't respond to the blips. No, no, no. It'll do what you need. Oh, yeah. It'll it requires you to do what you do. Yeah. But what I described in terms of not having the tack needle yeah. move, it would no, be impossible to do in a car that's really over carbureted with like the funny, Webers. The funny thing is, so the the reason that the throttle blip works with something like a Weber carb is because th- there's an accelerator pump in there. So basically, you your the carburetor is supplying as much fuel as there is airflow, ideally, and it, that's what its job. It doesn't get there. That but is it tries. Its design goal, right? And then one of the things is as you squirt, as you push the gas pedal down it's actually pumping an extra squirt of gas in and that's there for transient response so you know as you go from a closed throttle to an open throttle it doesn't go momentarily lean and it's a terrible thing to do for fuel economy to do a bunch of blips because every time you're blipping you're squirting in a whole shit ton of extra fuel i actually developed that habit before i owned anything with a carburetor strangely (laughs) um because to me it was a way to get revs up but not get any load on the clutch Yes, so, because then it's a nice way to prevent sort of a stall because you have a little residual revs yep. there to help with that, but you're also not frying the clutch. Right, so no, there's revs, but no load. And yes. so revs, you know, and I'm talking 1,500, 1,200 yes. Yes, on a car that- like 2,500 exactly. or 3,500. So yeah. My VWs idle at 975 is, there, is the target. So this between 950 and 1050. So they idle at 1,000 and I will not allow <laughs> anything over 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 more to, when I'm starting out, unless it's a massive hill and I got, you know, I have to be floored. But how I get that is, and I started that when I had a Kevlar clutch because mm-hmm. it would not allow too much slippage. Yeah. So you had yes. to know exactly where you were yeah. in that. The 964 is a little bit like yeah. that. My 964, yeah, your 964 has such is an aggressive, aggressive clutch. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, after driving with a five puck Kevlar race clutch uh, and that thing, I, and, and cams such yes. that the, the car could barely idle with yeah. no load on it, yeah. they could turn the AC on and the thing was like, fuck you. Yeah. Um, after that, shit. too much hot rotting. Mm-hmm. This is no exactly the manifestation of like excessive hot rotting. Yeah. But hey, you, you learn to drive anything. Um, yes. Anything that way. Yes. Um, okay. So I fully approve of your purple dog leg station wagon with its 7,000. Oh, hold on. It's a 320 or 300? 300. It's a 320. It's a 320. So it doesn't it have has, a 7,000 uh, It has LH, not LH. Yeah. It's called a uh, HF or something like that. It's a hot H- film, hot air film. So that's uh, But LH. it's not CIS. Yeah. 
So, but it's a three two with HFM. variable uh, variable intake manifold. So it's only a sixty four hundred RPM engine. Oh no! Yeah. Well, we'll see how gutless it is when it finally arrives. They're not. They're. I mean, that has a variable in length intake manifold. Um, which the 3.0 didn't. So the three liter was the one in the SL SL 300 or 300 SL, I guess. Yes. Um, and, and the 300 TE. They had a beautiful flat torque curve, and they never woke up. They never sort of. They that's had a variable valve timing, but they and they just pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled. And you're like, oh my god, that's seven thousand RPM in a you know in a Mercedes. That's wild. Yours has a big, huge bubble from an intake resonance uh, mm. that they got from making a variable length runner, which is why you have that crazy crossover pipe across the engine. Um, and they did they made a shit ton. The torque peak was significantly. I mean, two hundred more cc's is significant to go from three point zero to three point two. But the big difference is that uh, intake resonance. So it's got a huge, big bubble of torque down low. Um, so it's it, it'd, it'd be, be much agreeable. quicker. Yeah, All and right. it's a fucking dog leg. A dog leg wagon. Yes, dog leg station wagons. Are there others? Maybe in an E30? You could probably I'm, put an E3, E30. Th- yeah. No, but it, like, were they ever sold that way? Probably. No? Uh-huh. no? Not E30, that I'm, 325. I don't think the with 325 a, with a sport gearbox. I bet. Was, I bet that was a factory option. I don't think that knowing the German configurability. Mm-mm, I don't think the 325 I ever came with a five-speed dogleg option. Okay. I think it was just the regular. So is this the only dogleg station wagon in the world? If we've missed something, let us know in the comments. But I can't think of anything else off. No Sobs. No Volvos. No. Other Mercedes, Ford country no other Squire. Mercedes, right? Mercedes never did. There was no dog leg one twenty three. Nope. There was no dog leg two ten. There was no wow. The world's only dog leg station wagon. There is, you have it. Is that the title you heard of it this here episode? First, first. Yeah. unless we fucked it up. Unless we made an error, <laughs> in which case you also heard it here first because it, it was wrong, and so that's why no one else ever said it. Okay, great. Uh, well, that bombshell will conclude episode number ninety nine of the Carmudgeon oh, Show. No. Will 100 be the Piech episode or not? Are you going to do some research on Ferdinand Piech? If you find me something in English, I will. I would gladly do it. I would do the whole thing. Dude, we got a week before that episode goes live. We're, do you really have that much time? Should we do this? Should we I really would, try to? I would do it. Yeah. If you find me English materials, I will cover all of them. If you cover all the German materials, I will do it. Oh, my God. Do you like, we, you're talking about like 80. How old was he? 83, 88, oh, We don't have to be exhausted. We only need an hour worth, right? It's not a. But we're condensing a lifetime of achievements. This man is, I mean, he was a. Look at what happened to Volkswagen. His body wasn't even cold and they shit that Mark 8 out and ruined the whole company. Uh, not to mention harsh. Dieselgate. Well, that was, that was because of him. No, no, that yeah, was 100% probably. because of him. Yeah, of course it was. You know what I say now. And they did it. But then, you know, he was too old to protect them. Because he would have otherwise killed killed all the regulators. Um, Uh, um, That that really... Well, that was a P episode. (laughs) That's all you get. (laughs) Uh, See you for episode 100 of the Carmudgeon Show. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Tune in next week. Possibly. Possibly.